Ori and the Will of the Wisps is my favorite game, and I recently revisited its built-in time trials in an attempt to better understand the game's fluid and complex movement system. In the process, I became the 10th fastest player in the world for the Silent Woods time trial over the course of about a week. Today, we're going to walk through every part of that race, and how to better understand the game's mechanics to develop the fastest route. The Ori series is super fun for both casual playthroughs and for speedrunning, so hopefully this video helps get someone as excited about the game as I am. To get an idea of how this course works, let's watch an average player's attempt at this run that I found on YouTube. It seems pretty solid, right? They're following the intended route, they're moving pretty quickly, and they're never pausing or getting stuck. But every component of that run, down to the smallest detail, can be improved upon in some minor way, culminating in a time that's over 7 seconds faster than the run we just watched. Let's break it down. The race begins with two grapples. You grapple up to this first flower, and then go even higher to the second one before moving over to this rock. At first glance, the only thing you can do here to go a little faster than the player we just watched would be acting more quickly out of the grapples, which allow you to reach the rock sooner. However, we can do better than that in three ways. First, instead of grappling to that flower as soon as the race begins, you actually want to dash forward and then grapple. This seems counterintuitive. After all, it means you're spending more time on the ground, and your goal is to get high in the air as fast as possible but the grapple drags you upwards based on the angle between Ori and the flower when you initiate the grapple. So when you grapple from the race's starting point, you're moving at a diagonal angle and taking longer than necessary to reach the height from which you can see and grapple to that second flower. Dashing forward lets you grapple straight up, making the grapple much more effective at reaching this height and more than making up for the time spent dashing. Once you initiate the second grapple, you don't want to let yourself get pulled all the way up to the flower before continuing to the right. You can cancel out of your grapple at any point with a jump or a dash, and once you've obtained enough height to comfortably dash over to the rock, then any extra time spent grappling is just time wasted, so you want to cancel your grapple with a dash to begin moving over towards the right. In order to reach the rock as quickly as possible, you want to take advantage of the way Ori's movement is programmed. At any point in a dash, you can input a jump to cancel the rest of your dash, and then do whatever you want after the jump. And you can do the same with a dash at any point in a jump. This means, if you're fast enough, that you can do a dash, cancel the end lag of the dash with a jump after your initial burst of speed, and then immediately cancel the jump with a second dash to continue moving as quickly horizontally as possible. It's important to note here that normally Ori can only dash once in the air. But because your first dash is being done out of a grapple, that doesn't get counted as your aerial dash, and that's why you can do a second one immediately afterwards. If you were to just jump into the air and try to dash twice, you wouldn't be able to do that, but because we're dashing out of a grapple we can ignore that rule, and that's exactly what you want to do here. You dash to the right to interrupt the grapple, jump to interrupt the end of the dash, and then immediately dash again to reach the wall. Once you hit the wall, your next goal is pretty simple. You need to get over it and grapple up so that you're able to dash to the right and bash off of this flower. There are a few things you can do to speed up this part of the trial, but they're all pretty straightforward. First, instead of climbing up the rock to reach the top, instead you want to jump and then dash forward right when you're level with the top. This will let you get to the other side as quickly as possible while retaining your forward momentum from the dash, and because you landed on the platform while in the middle of the dash, even though you started and ended while airborne, it doesn't get counted as your aerial dash because you hit the ground. This means that you can do the same trick as before, jumping to cancel the end lag of your dash, and then immediately doing a second dash to move quickly to the right. Once the second dash is over, you can grapple up to the flower, and again you'll want to cancel the end of the grapple with a dash so you don't spend extra time stuck in the grapple. Everything we've done until this point is pretty consistent once you've practiced these techniques enough. But this next part is one of the most inconsistent sections of the entire run, even with lots of practice. What the game wants you to do is bash straight up, double jump, 
fall down onto this platform, and then jump back up and burrow through the sandbar so you can keep moving over to the right. The problem is that it wastes a lot of time to let yourself fall back down onto the platform and then jump up again, so we want to either avoid needing to land on the platform at all, or find a way to land on it without needing the extra wasted air time of going too high and then falling back down. Either of these options are doable, and I'll explain how to do them both, but I find the method I end up using to be slightly faster when it does work, so that's why I ended up using it in my final run. First, we could try to avoid the unnecessary airtime of falling back onto the platform by finding a way to land perfectly on it and then jumping up to burrow into the sandball. You could do this by bashing diagonally to the right and then jumping and dashing left. If done correctly, this will dash onto the sloped edge of the platform, and then you can cancel the dash into a jump from the platform itself now that you're treated as grounded, which allows you to burrow up into the ball. The timing for this can be a bit tricky, because you do need to dash at the right height to land on the sloped platform without any extra air time from going too high, but it doesn't take too much practice to get the hang of it. The problem is that this method still requires kind of a roundabout path to get to the sandball, so you could go even faster if you could figure out a way to get above that platform and close enough to burrow into the ball without needing to land on the platform at all. But when you bash straight up, you don't get quite enough height to land on the platform. Normally, this is intended to force you to double jump to get enough height, and then you fall back down onto the platform. But what I figured out is that you can instead drift left after your bash and grab onto this part of the wall right below the platform. From there, you can wall jump off, double jump, and that gets you just enough height to burrow into the sandball. This is way less consistent than the other method I just showed, because it requires a pretty precise bash angle, combined with drifting the right amount left afterward, but when done correctly, it's by far the fastest way to get enough height to burrow into the sandball. From there, you want to launch yourself out of the ball of sand diagonally, and perform the same jump cancel dashes that we talked about earlier to reach the second floating rock. There, just like before, you will need to jump over the lip of the rock, dash onto it, and complete another jump cancel dash to get far enough to the right that you can begin to burrow into the rock. It's important here to explain the way that burrowing works in Ori. First is obviously the direction you're holding while you burrow. You can control Ori's direction mid-burrow, which allows you to enter from one angle and exit at a different angle, but your ability to turn around is limited by where you entered the ball from. You can only turn around so much mid-burrow. So if, for example, you're entering from directly below the ball of sand, then you would only be able to exit at angles above the ball, and you wouldn't be able to make a full-on turn or go straight right or left. In this case, because your goal is to drift up and to the left afterwards, that means you want to enter from roughly below and to the right. This is done through the same set of tricks we used on the floating rock wall earlier. You want to jump up and over the edge with your double jump, and then dash onto and over the top of the rock. This refreshes both your double jump and your dash, allowing you to perform another jump cancel dash and move as far to the right as you can before you start burrowing into the ball. From there, dash to the left and double jump up to the hanging flower so that you can bash your way over the spikes and onto the final part of the time trial. From here, there's a pretty clear path the game wants you to follow to the end of the course. So let's revisit how that player from the beginning of the video approached this section. That can pretty clearly be improved upon in some major ways, so let's talk about those first. Upon landing on the ground next to the pit of sludge, you can dash off and then immediately jump to make sure you're not dashing down the slope into the sludge. From there, you can again cancel the jump into a dash and drift all the way to the left until you hit the bounce pad. After that, the only real improvement you can make would be to drift as far to the right as you can so you're not wasting extra time in the air before you dash onto the finish line. Right? Well, what if we could skip that whole process altogether? What if we didn't need to deal with crossing the pit of sludge, or the dead air time after bouncing off the bubble, or drifting back over to the right afterwards? Well, that's exactly what I did. That big hanging platform on which the finish line is located is solid, which means that Ori can grab onto it. That means that if you grab onto the lowest section of this wall and then let yourself slide off, you can dash to the left and jump back up on the other side to grab the wall again. Because getting to the lowest part of this wall is kind of difficult without just sliding down it and wasting time, there's a nice trick you can use to set this up consistently. 
Aim yourself after the bash so that you land on this ledge right here. It's a little less precise than it looks. You just have to make sure you don't go too far right and end up in the spikes. But from here, you can dash to the left and boom, they're set up perfectly at the bottom of the wall. Once you've gotten to the other side, you still need to get out from underneath this platform so you can climb on top of it and cross the finish line. To do that, you need to jump off the wall, dash left, and then as soon as the dash is done, you begin holding right while jumping, which lets you jump up and grab onto the edge of the platform. From there, jump again and dash onto the platform to cross the finish line and end the race. This strategy is difficult, and it requires a lot of practice to get the hang of, but it's a huge time saver over even the fastest methods that involve bouncing off the bubble. The biggest thing to keep in mind when practicing this part is that you will need to dash at different timings after your wall jump, depending on where on this wall you end up. If you're lower down on the wall, you might need the extra height from your jump before dashing left, and need to wait a little bit longer between the jump and the dash. Whereas if you're already at the top of the wall, then you would need to dash immediately to avoid bonking your head into the platform above you and beginning to lose height, which would stop you from quite being able to reach the ledge with your double jump. And that's it! This was the route and strategy that I used to claim the 10th fastest time in the world for the Silent Woods time trial, and in the process of labbing it out, I learned a ton about how the game engine works and how various mechanics intersect to create such a fun movement system. I decided to make this video to show off a small part of the complexity that makes Ori and the Will of the Wisps such a fun game to play, and to help anyone who's interested in learning more about the game get an idea of how I approached learning a time trial like this one. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something interesting. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more videos coming soon.